That was beautiful. Good morning. I am not Jan Bolton, although I would be honored to be Jan Bolton. I'm Jan Miller. <laughs> Welcome to the First Parish in Framingham. Welcome if this is your first time, and welcome back if, it, if this is the community you have, have claimed as yours. I am Jan Miller, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm on the board of assessors this year. I'll be your worship associate this morning. We are happy to welcome a guest in our pulpit this morning as Reverend Aaron is with family mourning the loss of his beloved grandmother. Reverend Alice Anacheka Naisman is the minister of the Unitarian Church of Marlboro and Hudson, where she has worked in different capacities for almost 20 years. She is trained as a facilitator for both laughter yoga and shake your soul yoga dance, and is the co-author of Four Tapestry of Faith, curricula for children. She lives in Hudson with her husband, their two young adult children, and their two fur babies, a dog and a cat. Welcome, Reverend Alice, and thank you for being here. First Parish is a welcoming congregation. We welcome you if you have grief weighing on your heart or if you have joy lifting your heart. We celebrate and welcome people of all ages, races, gender identities, sexual orientations, abilities, socioeconomic statuses, or beliefs. We welcome you here in the meeting house or on Zoom or wherever and whenever you may be watching this service in the future. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Unitarian Universalism is a liberal religion that honors wisdom from many sources. We keep our minds open to the religious questions people have pondered across vast times and places. Please be sure to read the announcements in the order of service. Immediately following worship, you're invited to join us for coffee hour in Scott Hall, just across the courtyard. Please take a moment to turn your phones or other devices to their quietest settings. While beeps and buzzes can be distracting, we do welcome your human noises, cooing, babbling, laughter, and all. We especially love the sound of your singing, so please join in. Since 1701, people have gathered as this community to rest or recharge, to be challenged or affirmed. Those people are like you. You belong here, maybe only for the next hour, but we hope for longer. We are happy to have you with us. I now invite you to take a deep breath in and out. Continue to take a few more deep breaths and to begin to release whatever you need to let go of to be more fully present to yourself, one another, and the sacred in this time and place. I'd like to invite Dante to come up to light our chalice this morning. A flame within a chalice. A flame within a chalice is a primary symbol of the Unitarian Universalist faith tradition to symbolize the light of reason, the warmth of community, and the flame of hope. It is our tradition to begin our worship by kindling the flame of our chalice. And on this morning of our first community breakfast, our call to worship was written by Starhawk and is entitled, Community Means Strength. 
We are all longing to go home to some place we have never been, a place half remembered and half envisioned. We can only catch glimpses of it from time to time. Community. Somewhere, there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having the words catch in our throats. Somewhere, a circle of hands will open to receive us. Eyes will light up as we enter. Voices will celebrate with us whenever we come into our own power. Community means strength that joins our strength to do the work that needs to be done. Arms to hold us when we falter. A circle of healing. A circle of friends. Some place where we can be free. Thank you, Dot. Please rise in body or spirit to sing hymn number 1007 in the Teal hymnal. There's a river flowing in my soul. Please remain standing and join us in our sung and spoken affirmations. They're printed in your order of service. the doctrine of this church, the quest of truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer, to dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve all life with compassion, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. This is our great covenant, one with another and with our God. Please be seated. Good morning. My name is Lauren Strauss. I am the Director of Religious Exploration here at First Parish. And I say to all of you, and you can say it with me, good morning. 
and welcome to church. Before I start my story, I'm going to say I could use a couple of helpers in religious exploration classes this morning. So if you are so moved, please feel free to come out with us at the end of this story. Okay, let me get this now. <clears throat> okay. A water bearer had two large pots, each hung on one end of a pole carried across the water bearer's neck. One of the pots had a crack in it. At the end of the long walk from the stream to the house, the cracked pot arrived only half full, while the other pot was perfect and always delivered a full portion of water. For two years, this went on daily, with the bearer bringing only one and a half pots full of water to the house. Of course, the perfect pot was proud of its accomplishments, perfect to the end for which it was made. But the poor cracked pot was ashamed of its own imperfection and miserable that it was able to accomplish only half of what it perceived to be bitter failure. After two years of this, it spoke to the water bearer one day by the stream. I am ashamed of myself and I want to apologize to you, said the pot. Why, said the bearer, what are you ashamed of? I have been able for the past two years to deliver only half my load because this crack in my side causes water to leak out all the way back to your house. Because of my flaws, you have to do extra work to deliver only half, um, and you don't get full value from your efforts, said the pot. The water bearer felt sorry for the cracked pot and compassionately said, as we return to the house, I want you to notice the beautiful flowers along the path. So off they went, and as they walked up the hill, they noticed the sun was warm and shining, and their beautiful wildflowers all along this one side of the path. And that cheered up the water pot very much. But at the end of the trail, it still felt sad because it had once again leaked out half its load. And so again, the pot apologized for being such a failure. The bearer said to the pot, did you notice that there were only flowers along your side of the path? Not on the other pot's side? That's because I have always known about your flaw. I saw it as your strength. I planted flower seeds on your side of the path and every day while we walk back from the stream, you water them. For two years, I've been able to pick beautiful flowers to decorate my table. Without you being just the way you are, I would not have this beauty to grace my house. We all have our unique flaws. We are all cracked pots. In the great web of life, nothing goes to waste. Don't be afraid of your flaws, acknowledge them, and you too can be the cause of beauty. Know that in our weakness, we find our strength.
And now we will sing our children, teachers, parents, anybody else who wants to come along through this exploration. Our commitment to human fellowship means that we are called upon to be glad with those who rejoice and to weep with those who mourn. Thus, we set aside this time in our gathering to share with one another the joys and concerns which are now shaping our lives. Just a reminder that you can submit your joys or sorrows either online or by writing them down in this book that is at the back of our sanctuary. We sing from the hymn, Comfort Me, so that our joys and sorrows can be held with song, but also so that you might have a song on your heart when you are joyful or sorrowful. I begin with the sorrows of our gathered community. Reverend Aaron shares, my family and I mourn the death of my grandmother, Marjorie. Our hearts have been warmed by all of the memories family have shared in the days after. Let us sing the first verse of Comfort Me. Comfort me. And these are the joys of our gathered community. Kevin Stern shares, I got to spend time with my friend of all friends and see my favorite artist in concert. And Tom Greeley shares, my mother, Pat Greeley, the ultimate teacher, gave her body to the Harvard Medical School she has now finished her teaching and is finally home. Let us now sing, sing with me, the second verse. Sing with me, sing. And we light one final candle for all of the joys and the sorrows too great to share. Let us now sing, Speak for Me. Speak for me. Speak for me. Speak for me, oh my soul. I share with you the words of the Reverend Sam Trumbor as we gather together in a time of contemplation. Let us turn inward now. Feel the rhythm of the breath, in and out. 
in and out. Find the peace of just being with the flow of the breath. Letting go of yesterday and tomorrow. Feel the restorative power of the peace of this moment. A peace large enough to open to the concerns and sorrows that trouble us. A stillness quiet enough to respond to the joys and celebrations that enliven us. There is safety here in the rhythm of the breath. The ebb and flow of life is enacted with each one, taking in oxygen sustenance, letting go of carbon dioxide waste, taking in the fullness of experience, letting go of the residue that wants to cling to us, Cultivate inner peace and inner safety in this sanctuary, dedicated to cultivating the spirit of life, dedicated to being a beacon of love for all beings. Let us take a few moments to savor the peace and stillness in a time of silence. Amen, blessed be, may it ever be so. Please join in singing hymn number 360, Here We Have Gathered. Our offering invitation words come from our former ministerial intern, Michael Hall. As we approach the time for our offering, 
Give what you will for the church that has meant so much to you, for the church that meant so much to those who came before you, and for the church that will mean so much to people you will never know. Give what you will, for you are a generous people. If you are visiting us this morning, please feel free to let the plate pass by. The morning offering will now be gratefully received. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be here with you for my first time in this beautiful building, hearing the lovely sounds of the music, sharing in worship traditions that are so similar to ours, but also finding the wonderful differences. Thanks for having me this morning. I begin with the expert with this excerpt from the book Illusions, the adventures of a reluctant Messiah by Richard Bach. Once there lived a village of creatures along the bottom of a great crystal river. The current of the river swept silently over them all, young and old, rich and poor, good and evil, the current going its own way, knowing only its own crystal self. Each creature in its own manner clung tightly to the twigs and the rocks of the river bottom, for clinging was their way of life and resisting the current what each had learned from birth. But one creature said at last, I am tired of clinging. Though I cannot see it with my eyes, I trust that the current knows where it's going. I shall let go and let it take me where it will. Clinging, I shall die of boredom. The other creatures laughed and said, fool, 
Let go and that current you worship will throw you tumbled and smashed across the rocks and you will die quicker than boredom. But the one heeded them not and taking a breath did let go and at once was tumbled and smashed by the current across the rocks. Yet in time, as the creature refused to cling again, the current lifted him free from the bottom and he was bruised and hurt no more. And the creatures downstream to whom he was a stranger cried, see a miracle, a creature like ourselves, yet he flies. See the Messiah come to save us all. And the one carried in the current said, I am no more Messiah than you. The river delights to lift us free if we only dare to let go. Our true work is this voyage, this adventure. But they cried the more savior, all the while clinging to the rocks. And when they looked again, he was gone. And they were left alone, making legends of a savior. Joseph was a slender, awkward, painfully shy preteen living in an orphanage in Kenya. I was in college working as a student teacher. It was my job to teach Joseph. It was very clear that he had not received a lot of education before arriving at the orphanage. At least half of every assignment that he worked on was incorrect. I hated seeing the demoralized but not surprised look on his face when I handed back his papers covered in red X's. When I would ask Joseph a question in class, he would freeze, even though I tried to ask him questions I was positive he knew the answers to. But he was so afraid of failure in those moments that his ability to take in new, in new information or to access the information that he had disappeared. One day I decided to try something different. Instead of marking the answers that were wrong, I circled the answers that were right and I put big red check marks next to them. When Joseph looked at that paper, he was transformed. A huge smile spread across his face, a smile like nothing I'd seen on him before. I got them right, he proclaimed over and over again with joy. Joseph was paralyzed by his fear of failure. He needed a success. But circling the correct answers rather than putting an X by the incorrect answers did not actually change anything about his, the quality of the work. It just changed the lens that we were looking through. Over the remaining weeks of my internship, as Joseph felt just a little less fear of failure, he opened up just a little bit more to learning. In some ways, this is similar to the story that Lauren told earlier. The water pot experienced itself as a failure because it had a hole. It felt flawed and terribly ashamed. The water bearer shifted the perspective. Instead of seeing the hole as a flaw, he recognized the opportunity and planted a garden that he would never have to water. There is a great deal of evidence in the business world in the new age spiritual world, in the scientific world of psychology and neuroscience that shows that the ability to move past the fear of failure, to embrace failure with curiosity is crucial in achieving success. Successful people are not people who don't fail, they're people who know how to fail well. I have to admit that phrase embrace failure, that word failure is not entirely comfortable for me. In my mind, and I imagine for some of you as well, that word failure, the experience of failure is not something I want to embrace and hold close to myself. And yet failure has so very much to teach us. Failure teaches us the spiritual practices of commitment, of patience, of determination. It teaches us how to handle frustration. It shows us what we did wrong so we can correct it. It helps us correlate our actions with consequences so we can take responsibility. Failure teaches us humility. 
to recognize that we do still have things to learn and might actually need help from someone else. These are some of the benefits of a failure positive, curious learning mindset. On the other hand, when we do everything that we can to avoid any chance of failure, when we live with that fear of failure, this can have negative consequences for us. It can keep us from taking risks, stop us from trying new things, speaking up. It holds us back, prevents us from filling our, reaching our full potential. We give up, we stop trying. I wonder if I told you this morning that you could do anything and know that you could not possibly fail, that success was guaranteed, what would you do? What new skill or hobby would you learn? What life change would you make? Would you enter into a new relationship, buy a new house, leave your job, change career, move, retire? I wonder if we remove the fear of failure, what new genius might emerge? What would be waiting to be born in your life? What would we find if we let go of the rocks that we cling to and allowed the current to carry us downstream? I wonder what beautiful gardens we might water. Author Terry Bragg offers some suggestions to move past the fear of failure, embracing failure with a curious mindset. Step one, take action. Bold, decisive action. Do something scary. The fear of failure immobilizes you. To overcome this fear, you must act. When you act, act boldly. Step two, persist. Success is not immediate. The late great musical legend Elvis Presley was fired after his first performance at the Grand Ole Opry. The manager actually told Elvis, you ain't going nowhere, son. You ought to go back to driving a truck. Then there's Babe Ruth, famously known for holding the record for home runs in baseball for 52 years. When he retired, Babe Ruth also held the record for the most strikeouts. So persist. Don't listen to those voices, internal or external, that tell you you ain't going nowhere. Step three, do things differently. If what you're doing isn't working, do something else. There's that old saying, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. As an example, in the early 1900s, when it snowed, there was no way to remove snow from the windshield of the trolleys or the cars. People would actually drive around in the snow with their head out the window so they could see. Or they would even just have to stop the car over and over again to clear the snow off. Enter Mary Anderson in 1903, a woman from Alabama, a place where driving in the snow was not an issue, a fresh perspective. While visiting New York and taking a trolley ride during the winter time, she saw how the driver was driving with the window wide open and his head sticking out the window. Surely, she thought, there must be a better way. And so she invented the windshield wiper. Steps four and five from Terry Bragg. Don't take failure personally and don't be so hard on yourself. The law of feedback states there is no failure, there is only feedback. Successful people look at mistakes as outcomes or results, not as failure. Unsuccessful people look at mistakes as permanent and personal. Failure is not a personality characteristic. Although what, you may do, although what you do may not give you the result you wanted, it doesn't mean that you're a failure. Take, for example, Thomas Edison, who made 10,000 attempts at the light bulb. Edison is reported to have said that he didn't fail 10,000 times. He discovered 10,000 ways that didn't work. <laughs> Step six. 
Treat the experience as an opportunity to learn. Be curious about the failure. What can this teach you for the future? How can you use this experience to improve yourself or your situation? Ask yourself these questions. What was the mistake? Why did it happen? How could it have been prevented? How can I do better next time? What else could I try? Step seven, fail forward fast. Tom Peters, the management guru, says that in today's business world, companies must fail forward fast. What he means is that the way we learn is by making mistakes. So if we want to learn at a faster pace, we must make mistakes at a faster pace as well. He instituted the Turtle Award, Award for workers who stuck their head out like a turtle and had the most spectacular failure, but the failure that provided the most learning. And finally, step eight, look for possible opportunities that result from the experience. Napoleon Hill, author of Think and Grow Rich, says every adversity, every failure, and every heartache carries with it the seed of an equivalent or a greater benefit. As I conclude my sermon, I share with you these stories of epic failures that had the seed of an equivalent or greater benefit. We'll start with the chocolate chip. I know it's hard to imagine a time when there were no chocolate chips, but it's true. A woman named Ruth Wakefield was running the Toll House Inn right here in Massachusetts. She went to bake a batch of chocolate chip cookies and discover that she had run out of chocolate cookies, not chocolate chip cookies, discovered that she had run out of baker's chocolate. So as an experiment, she grabbed some chocolate bars, broke them up into pieces, fully expecting that they would bake into, melt into the cookie dough, and she would get her chocolate cookies. But they didn't, and chocolate chips were born. Another example, the chemist William Henry Perkin was working on a cure for malaria. His experiments ended up with a strange goo that did not have any medical benefit. But when he looked at it closely, he saw that the goo was a beautiful color. And so it was that Perkin created the first synthetic dye and also created the color mauve. Another happy failure. A chef in Saratoga Springs got really angry at a customer who kept sending his food back, asking for his potatoes to be more thinly sliced. In a fit of rage, the chef sliced those potatoes ridiculously thin, fried them up, and sent them out. To his surprise, the customer was delighted, and potato chips came into being. Post-it notes were invented by a man who was working for a company that was trying to find a super strong glue. Instead, in an epic fail, they came up with a glue that was actually weaker than any other. Four years later, another scientist from that company was singing in his church choir. He noticed how the markers in the hymnals kept falling out. He remembered the glue failure, and he tried it. Ten years later, the company started selling post-it notes. And finally, an example I find a little bit concerning. The chemist Konstantin Falberg was experimenting in his lab, trying to come up with some new uses for coal tar. One evening, he forgot to wash his hands. While he was eating dinner, he noticed that the rolls tasted surprisingly sweet. He asked his wife if she'd done anything special or different with the rolls that evening. When she told him she hadn't, he realized the sweetness was coming from his unwashed hands. The next day, he went back to his lab, and I really don't recommend you try this at home, <laughs> and walked around tasting things until he found the source, which he ultimately developed into the artificial sweetener saccharin. As I said, a little concerning. <laughs> of course, any one of these things, these accidental discoveries, these quote unquote failures could have happened and been forgotten or ignored completely. Louis Pasteur once said, chance favors the prepared mind, the mind that is prepared to learn from mistakes 
and take advantage of the unexpected results. We wouldn't have post-it notes or potato chips if the people in these stories had simply walked away from the failures instead of recognizing the opportunity that they presented. Earlier, I asked you what you would do if I could guarantee that you would not fail. Of course, there are no such promises or guarantees that we won't fail. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We are bound to experience setbacks along the way. We are bound to make mistakes. If we let go in the water, we might get bashed against the rocks. But when we embrace our failures and learn to fail well, when we walk through the world with a curious mindset, we can move from the ordinary to the extraordinary. We can create wonderful new possibilities in our lives, and we just might find that we've created chocolate chip cookies, invented a new color, or watered an exquisitely beautiful garden. May it ever be so. I invite you to rise in body and or spirit for the hymn 1008 in the teal hymnals when our heart is in a holy place. When our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, we are blessed with love and amazing grace. When our heart is in a holy place, when we trust the wisdom in each of us, every color. I share with you these benediction words by the Reverend Adam Slate. Be kind, be brave, be just, be merciful, be hopeful. This is how we keep the chalice flame burning until we are together again to light it anew. Amen. Blessed be. May it ever be so.